Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be invited uh, to speak to you today. And uh, my topic is open content as a business proposition. And I will talk about that, but really my interest is more helping you to have a way of thinking, not just about open content, but about business in general. And it's more I'm using this as an illustration. Uh, I'd like to... I'd like to start by giving a little bit of my personal background so that you can maybe see where I come from a little bit. Okay, and like how I encountered open content in general. So in my, um, my undergrad degree was in computer science. I did that at Louisiana State University in the United States, which I said late 90s, actually mid 90s. And uh, as a computer science student, I loved IT. I was all into the IT and I like to program, I like to use software, but when you do IT related uh, things, you need a lot of software, but as a student, I was poor. I couldn't afford a lot of the software and they didn't have things like the MSDNA program where you can get all kinds of free software. We, we had to try to scramble, buy or something or copy it. But as far as copying software, I mean, I did that a bit, but I had a little problem, actually a big problem. It's called my conscience. My conscience didn't, wasn't very comfortable about that. And so one thing that I discovered was open source software. I said that, wow, there's all this software that's free, that people just make free available. I would have said great software, but Sometimes it's great, but especially for user uh, kind of software, like there's open source web processors and things like that, and they weren't that great. They're kind of substitute and so on. I mean, I can afford Microsoft Office. So okay, I'll use things like uh, Abbey Word and so on. But I really appreciate it. Then uh, I had some successive revelations uh, during my doctoral studies. OpenOffice.org came out. And, and just to give you a perspective, uh, there was, uh, at that time, there was nothing that was even comparable to Microsoft Office that was available for free. But um, OpenOffice, before it became free, was, uh, before it became open source software, was actually made freeware as uh, Star Office. And I used that, and it was pretty good software. But Open source goes beyond just freeware. It means that people can, especially from a programmer's perspective, people can download the source code and actually see how it works and actually modify it. And I was just flabbergasted that something that complex, that valuable, could be made available like that. And that uh, Sun Microsystems would open up their source code in that way. Then. Later on, after I became a professor here at Concordia, I started here at 2003, uh, I remember another huge revelation, uh, an eye-opener in 2004 with, that's when Firefox 1.0 came out. And it's hard to have the perspective, but so as someone who appreciated open source software, one of the main problems with it is that it wasn't that user-friendly. It's like from an IT person, okay, it's a computer science person, and then my grad studies were in management information systems, so kind of BTM. I took on the business perspective. And so I appreciated that it's not enough to just be functional, but you have to be useful. You have to be user friendly so that ordinary people could use it. And Firefox was the first open source software that I ever saw that had a professional, user friendly, business oriented marketing scheme to be for the masses. And that was, you're probably all used to that, but that was really groundbreaking, that uh, software could, that open source software could be like that. Then, now open source software, uh, there's different kinds of it, it's mainly user oriented. Then Linux has been around since uh, the early 1990s, and it was something that I wouldn't even consider, because I said that it's just not usable. I mean, it's usable if you're really techy, but if you want to do things handy, friendly, Linux just wasn't there. And then in 2006, uh, Ubuntu 
6.0, version 6.06 .06 came out, uh, Drapper Drake is what it was called. And that was just amazing because that's when Linux became user friendly. When Linux could be not just for administrators, not for systems admins, but it actually marketed to desktop users. And this was the first version of any Linux platform that I saw that re literally your grandmother could use. And literally, because it's even, it's easy, it was easier, if it's just the basic things, it's easier than Windows, easier than Mac. It just does what it does and basic user friendly format. So these were revelations that um, open source software was becoming more business oriented. Not, when I say business, let's say user oriented, looking at the, the user face. And then I had another revelation, this was probably around 2005, and that was discovering Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia was first founded around 2001, and increasingly when you do web searches, you would see things. Sometimes I see Wikipedia or free encyclopedia, and more and more I saw they actually had useful results for a lot of things I was searching for, and said free encyclopedia, okay, it's free, great. But then one day, I think it was around 2005, I said, what is this? Where, who makes it? What does it really do? And I really studied the background of Wikipedia. And I was amazed that here is an encyclopedia which actually uses the open source philosophy to pre present something. And at that time, uh, Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica was the gold standard of encyclopedias. It had been for over 100 years. And here was something that was just put together by volunteers that was increasingly challenging the quality of Britannica. Again, most of you are not, I'm giving you the background, the evolution, because I think most of you just take for granted Wikipedia, that's the go-to encyclopedia for everywhere. But I saw the evolution of this. But what struck me about Wikipedia was not just, okay, the usefulness of it, but when you compare it to open source software, open source software is a great concept, but really only programmers can contribute to it. Only programmers can, sh can, if you can't code, you can't contribute. But Wikipedia was something that anyone could contribute to. Anyone with internet access could add improved articles. How many people here have ever edited anything in Wikipedia? Raise your hand. Okay. Does anyone know? Okay, I guess those know, but you guys know that anyone can literally edit. You can just click edit and just add stuff. And please don't add nonsense. They have tons of tools that will almost instantly detect vandalism and nonsense and get rid of it. But you can continually improve it in whatever way. And this transitioned me from just open source software to the wider world of open content. And so now I want to talk about that from the BTM perspective. So BTM, Business Technology Management, when I try to explain to people what it is, I say it's IT and business, so using computers and business. It's more than that, because not just business, it includes healthcare, education, uh, government, and it's uh, certainly not just computers, it's any kind of information technology, but it's a simple way to present it. So I want to talk about the IT aspect of information products, open content, and I'll talk a little bit about the business aspect, mainly from my business perspective. So first, we need to understand the IT characteristics of information products in general. So not just open content, but digital products. Uh, the first thing is to note that it is about information. It's about what is in our minds. It's not a physical product. Sure, you can print it out. Sure, you can look it on a computer screen, but that's not what it is. It's something that is in someone's mind. They represent it and then get it into other people's minds. And the value of the product is this information. So that's the core of an information uh, product. Uh, so, and, and so IT, information technology, handles that. Then IT, the physical technology, the physical media that actually is used to view it, to create it, to distribute it. So we need to understand these different media uh, and 
like here there is, uh, you have computers, uh, tablets, smartphones, and I should actually include print because print is very much a delivery medium. You can still print uh, these things. That is also a very valid medium. And a lot of technologies such as print on demand, so when someone publishes a book, they don't have to print uh, 10,000 copies and hope they make a profit. They can just print whenever someone makes an order and have very little uh, marginal cost. So that's a huge IT-enabled innovation. Then another aspect of IT that's very critical for, for information products is the minimal cost of reproduction. You produce one copy, it costs the same thing as producing 10 million copies. Uh, because it's just a matter of sending the same original over the internet to anyone's uh, computer. And that's a real game changer in that when you're looking at the business economics of it, reproduction and scale is not so much a, f uh, a factor. Then uh, distribution, worldwide uh, distribution, especially through the internet as an IT innovation, is look at how do you get it uh, to users. So that's the IT side of understanding uh, uh, what the nature of information products are. Now, when I want to talk about the business side, I'm going to come, become very personal and talk about my personal philosophy of business. It's a particular way of thinking about things. And uh, I like to call my philosophy conscientious commerce. Okay. And to understand what I mean by conscientious commerce, uh, I like to contrast it with what you might call pure commerce. And that is the standard way that uh, people think of commerce, uh, think of business. And pure commerce is buy low, sell high. And it's implied, leave them dry. Basically, you obtain resources at the lowest possible cost, uh, and then you try to take those resources, whatever you do with them, and give them off to people at the highest possible cost, you pocket the difference, that's your profit. So for a lot of people, that's what business is about, that's what commerce is about, and this is a prevailing perspective of business. So conscientious commerce is very much another perspective. Uh, conscientious commerce is, I also call it value commerce, because it's about creating value for people. That's what uh, business is all about. I really enjoyed the IBM presentation. I'm a big fan of IBM, have been for a lot of years. You can see this laptop. It's a ThinkPad. It's a Think, because uh, the Think uh, brand was created uh, by IBM before they sold it to Lenovo. However, Lenovo made a very smart decision. They kept the people, the most valuable resource, and they've uh, kept the quality of it. Um, and I really enjoyed their presentation because if you notice, there's hardly any talk about making money. It was almost entirely about how do you help people, how do you give people what they want, how do you solve people's problems. For me, that's what business is fundamentally about. And that's what we need to be thinking about. So, uh, but this is very much a matter of taking care of our conscience. Our conscience is basically now, our conscience is a very individual thing. My conscience is not your conscience, and one of the worst things is when people impose their conscience on someone else. But when we take care of our own conscience, then that's really what separates us from animals. I mean, animals have physical bodies like we. Animals have are psychological beings. They have emotions. Uh, animals can think much less than we, but they're still psychological beings. But we have a conscience, and that's what makes us human. And that's what separates us. Uh, so really, in business, taking care of our conscience is, uh, for me, is the most crucial thing in the sense of we want to help people, and we, we want to be guided by that. Uh, now, of course, we all make mistakes, and no one can take care of their conscience uh, perfectly. But there's a huge difference between um, and a lot of times when maybe we do something, our conscience is not comfortable with it. It's a big difference between saying that, hey, I, I messed up, what I did was wrong, versus justifying ourselves and explaining that, okay, it's justified because I have to take care of my investors or whatever. 
there's a huge difference between that. And I was even thinking about it in some of the scandals that were talked about in the last uh, security uh, part of the discussion. Now, a key aspect of conscientious, con uh, conscientious commerce is realizing that people are worth more than money. And really getting away from the money thinking to the people thinking. Um, and really, for me, money is not real. Uh, if you study economics, the philosophy of economics, money is like a placeholder to represent value. Someone has one kind of value, another person has another kind of value. They're incommensurate. Okay, money kind of represents it. Money itself is not real. The real thing is what people actually want, what they value, what you want to take care of. And uh, you've heard the phrase, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I mean, I believe that. I know this is heresy in a business school, so I'm a bit of a business heretic. Uh, money is evil, absolutely. But what is behind money? Uh, really, when we focus on money, then we ignore the people that are behind the money. We ignore what people really want, what people really value. So we need to look at what, what, who are the people behind the money, what do the people really value, and that's what we're going for. Bottom line, we need to take care of our conscience. So that's my business uh, philosophy. And I'm going to talk now about open content and business models. And my perspective of conscientious commerce applies to anything I do in business. And this happens to be the topic du jour. So this is what uh, we're going to look at from this perspective. So first, I'll, try, I'll talk a little bit more about what is open content, essentially. So open content is legally re redistributable information products. Um, freeware in general, something that someone says you can download for free, is not necessarily open content. Uh, YouTube, yeah, anyone can look at YouTube for free, but that's not open content. Uh, because if you read the YouTube terms and conditions, which no one does, it tells you that you can only view YouTube. You're not allowed to download it on your computer. And for sure, you're not allowed to download a YouTube, compute, uh, a YouTube video and then upload it on someone else's, on your own server for other distribution. You can link to it. You can use there's HTML codes. You can show it on your web page. But it has to be through YouTube. So that is not open content. Open content lets you, at the very least, download it, share it with others, you can upload it and distribute it. It might say you can't change it, but at the very least, you can download, you can reshare. That's open content. So that's what I'm talking about. And the legal aspect is very important. First, because legal means that the person who created it, who owns it, is giving permission. And we're honoring the person's uh, permission. We're respecting people. And of course, on the other side, especially from a business perspective, if you don't take care of the legal stipulations, well, you open yourself to lawsuits, and then, then money becomes, seems a lot more real to you uh, in that scenario. So this is what I, I talk about with open content. And let's look at different kinds of open content. Um, I have a research framework for looking at open content. And from that, there's four general, fundamentally different kinds. Uh, the first I call utilitarian works. And these are information products whose value is not, it's rather subjective. It might be valuable for one person, but not for another. And you can't really say it's right or wrong. It's just, is it useful to me or not? So the classic example is open source software. That's what it is. This software is useful for me, but not to you. And you can measure what's more functional or not. Then uh, other kinds of that category are open recipes. Uh, so there's a site called open source food where if you're in the, um, in the food industry, you can download, you can share recipes, mix them up, uh, share them. Uh, WikiHow is a website that gives how-to guides on all kinds of things. And it's kind of like Wikipedia, but uh, except that it's how to do things. So from a, a business perspective, the, the real, a big value of this is that a business so you as a business manager, and I like to talk to you as business managers, business managers in training at least, when, if you use these things, 
you're saving a lot of development costs. You don't have to create it from scratch. Uh, and these are things that you don't use these things for competitive advantage, that's for sure. Competitive advantage, you keep proprietary within your organization. But a lot of software, a lot of things that you use are things that everyone uses. So rather than building it from scratch, use the best practice uh, software platform that is used by a lot of people, that is improved by a lot of people. So the next category of open content is uh, what I call factual works. And these are content where it really is a matter, is it true or false? And it can be de debated if it's true or false, but you can have that debate. So Wikipedia as an encyclopedia is a classical example uh, where they have, um, uh, okay, so Wikipedia has articles whose content is either true or false. Then OpenStreetMap is basically like an open source Google Maps. It's, uh, and you should check it out. It has uh, all, all the same features. The thing, obviously, the coverage is not uh, quite as complete. And uh, there's no uh, street view for that, for example. Yes? OK. OK. So in some places like Walt Disney World, OpenStreetMap might actually be more complete than in Google Maps. So it's a matter of if the organization uploads their map there, makes it available to the community. Uh, but there are a lot of restrictions in using um, Google Maps, Apple Maps, uh, Bing Maps. And if your organization wants unrestricted use, then OpenStreetMaps is uh, an option there. So people who are interested in geographic uh, content uh, can use it. And I remember uh, during the last Haiti earthquake, OpenStreetMap was very crucial for the humanitarian care because the people on the ground could share uh, where people were and upload it quickly <laughs> without having to go through Google. And so uh, there are very practical applications for it. Another example is open education resources. So there are a lot of open source textbooks where uh, professors contribute to, they can change, they can improve. And so there are resources like that. The next category of open content is aesthetic works. And these are things that are just for beauty, for pure personal pleasure, and where what is beautiful to one person is ugly to another, but that's the nature of it. So Flickr is a site uh, that where people can upload uh, photography. Uh, Flickr is not all, or by any means, even mostly open content. But Flickr very much supports it. So a lot of content of Flickr is open content. Uh, so open content of uh, photographs. Jamendo is a site for open music. Um, I've actually done a research uh, project on that. So a lot of musicians upload their music, and people can download for free, can share it for free. So a lot of these conflicts where musicians have of people downloading, sharing illegally, well, Jamendo says, well, take care of it by making it legal. And so there's tons of music on there. And there are some, um, uh, even some known artists on there. But most of those who have labels don't go there. Open video is much rarer because videos are m very expensive to make. Uh, there's uh, the Blender Foundation that has made a few proof of concept animation videos. Uh, Big Buck Bunny is one of them. Uh, uh, you, if you just search for it, you can, uh, it's like a short animation. Uh, so for business, it's a, uh, Jamendo uh, is the main one here that is used uh, for business. They have a lot of licensing schemes where, uh, because in any business that has to receive music, that uses music, such as a restaurant that ha has music ambience, if you go to any store, a department store that has music ambience, has to pay for that. So Jamendo provides a way that uh, commercial licensing of their music, because a lot of open content might say that it's legal to share for non-commercial purposes, but for commercial purposes, you have to pay. So that's a big thing that's often used. So Jamendo uh, has a huge uh, business in uh, licensing uh, a lot of diverse music. So you do find quite good quality music, because there is a revenue stream for the artists who uh, present their music there. And it's much cheaper than licensing through the other, uh, other traditional means. Uh, last category is opinioned works. And these are things like essays, uh, philosophical texts that are just works of opinion. Someone says it's true, but hey, that's your opinion. Uh, the main commercial aspect of that is called open access. 
And that's where scholarly articles are made available open, where uh, a scholar uh, pre presents a research article. Most of the time, you have to pay for it, a subscription to a journal to get it. But open access makes it uh, free for any reader. Um, and it's a very big movement. I'm a scholar, so I'm very much involved in open access, uh, though there's a lot of conflicts in that. OK, so those are uh, main categories of open content to kind of uh, understand uh, the concepts of what we're talking about. Now, to consider how you can use it effectively for business, it's important to understand who the stakeholders are. And the stakeholders are who are the people involved. And there's four uh, general categories of people. First are the creators. The creators are the people who obviously create the content, the programmers who program the software, uh, people who write uh, the manuals or whatever you want to make available. As a business manager, they might be your employees. And considering that, okay, what do these people care about? Uh, why are they uh, creating these things? The next are the consumers. And those are people who read, who view the videos, who listen to the music, uh, who, who actually use it. So open content is mainly a transmission from the creators to the consumers. And so these are the two most important categories to realize. However, distributors, those who come in between, those who help the creators to create or help them to connect them to the consumers are also crucial because creators are not always well positioned to that. So a lot of uh, organizations serve in the distributor position where they hire creators and then they, they market to their customers as, uh, as the consumers. And in every industry, there's some other categories. Sometimes there's regulatory requirements in the government. Uh, sometimes, like in the music industry, you have uh, producers uh, and so on. Okay. So these are the uh, major categories of stakeholders to recognize. And the next thing is, once you recognize the stakeholders, the people, look at how do you create value for them. And there are... Uh, four main, and value is what do they care about? What are their priorities? And there's four main categories of that. So ironically, the first main category is money. <laughs> and that's how do you pay for all this? Uh, and one of the big uh, research questions in this area is how do you make money by giving stuff away for free? Now, from a money perspective, it's a big paradox. But if, from a value commerce, a conscientious commerce perspective, the right question is, how do you create value for people by giving it away for free? And suddenly, there's all kinds of avenues there. And so uh, the money there largely represents revenue for the creators. Because creators usually love what they do, so they, they would love to do it full time, but they have bills to pay, they have to... Uh, take care of a lot of things. So it's very important to ha recognize what is the revenue stream to take care of the creators and also the distributors. So why are they con doing all this connecting work that is valuable to consumers and to the creators? So how do you support that? So, uh, and from the consumer side is the price. I mean, and it's very important from a business perspective to realize that uh, open content, well, for a consumer using it, it seems free. But for a business, it's almost never free. For example, a Linux. If you're going to use Linux, as all the large companies do, at least on the back end, it's not just, OK, download it because it's free and install it, no cost. Uh, well, you need support. Uh, so, so even if you train your own support people, there's training for that. Uh, you need maintenance. Uh, sometimes there might be a bug. Well, you need to hire someone to take care of your bug. There's customization for your use. Now, when you take all that into consideration, open content is way cheaper than proprietary content, but it's not zero cost. So these are things to consider. Then quality is the, probably the most important thing. You want to create things of quality. And without taking care of the revenue, uh, taking care of people's needs, they're going to create half-hearted works. It's not going to have the quality that you need. So it's very important to look at what are the measures in place to make sure that the quality is maintained at the standard that you need. Then dissemination is a major goal. Of how do you get it out to people? And uh, usually the creator wants their works to be disseminated. 
But a lot of times distributors have the conflict because they only want it to be disseminated as long as they can get money. But with open content, you look for ways that as long as you get into a lot of people's hands, you create network value. Uh, and a lot of times there's secondary uh, benefits, so not necessarily direct natural payment, but sometimes there's some ancillary products or services that increase the value that, that might be paid for those who really want that. So for a lot of, uh, that's why with a lot of cloud services, you might have a, a freemium, a free version, then you have a pro version. So the free version has a few features and the pro version has more features. So that supports a payment uh, for everyone. Then uh, finally and very important in the context of open content is what I call renown. And this could be reputation or fame. And that's a matter of giving credit to people. So a lot of people who participate in the open source software world, uh, they distribute free, but they want their name to be credited because when their names are credited, they build reputation as a high quality producer. And th through that, they can get uh, better jobs, uh, promotions, they can get more contracts. So uh, properly crediting people is often a crucial aspect. And for me, it's a matter of uh, honoring people uh, in what they do. Okay, so that's, uh, this is just to give you some perspectives and uh, some thinking. I think my time is up. And um, I, there's some further information in a couple of articles that are open content available uh, for, for reading. And thank you very much. Yeah.